If you don't know who I am, my name is Nick. I have the privilege of preaching to your youth every single Friday. Uh, and it is amazing to be the youth pastor here. Unfortunately, I am taking over for Mike, who is away. He had to take care of some family business uh, up in Orlando and DC. Uh, and so when you do see him, when he comes back, just give him your condolences and love up on him a little bit and, and the Myers family as a whole. I'm excited though, because I not only get to preach on a Sunday, uh, but also because I continue on this sermon series that, that Mike started about a year ago. It was really just understanding Paul and his entire walk from the book all the way of Acts into his prison epistles, which we're currently at. And then when we continue on, it will be his pastoral epistles. And today we're covering up the, the Philippians chapter three of that. And so some background context in case you've forgotten Paul is the, the writer of this letter. And, and he's writing to the church of Philippi from prison. And see, Philippi, it, it really is near and dear to his heart. It's near and dear to his heart because it's one of the first churches that Paul plants in Europe. And he loves this church. The issue with this church, though, is that it's a Rome, Roman citizen's church. It, it, it's a church that's predominantly only Roman citizens. See, Philippi, the city, it's a colony of Rome, which means they all get that fancy titles. They get the, uh, the privilege of voting, and they, they get the privilege of having citizenships, and they get the privilege of being elected, and, and they, their citizen is in Rome. They can even legally marry. And so majority of this entire church are Roman citizens, not Jews, not people who understand the, the Old Testament, but newer, newer believers. And so he begins this really as a thank you. See, Philippi sent him money while he's in prison. And so he sits there and he, he really writes this letter as a, a thank you, like, hey, thank you so much. Here's a couple updates. I'm gonna send Timothy back to you guys. Uh, but also as I'm writing this letter, I'm gonna give you some sound doctrine. I'm gonna give you some words of encouragement. See, I'm in prison, I know you might be worried, I might possibly die, but understand this, there's joy to be had in the cross. And regardless of situations, be joyous. And so he writes this letter really just saying, man, persevere with your faith. There's a process and, 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 and there's progress to be had in your faith, you are not who you once were. And last week we saw Pastor Mike, he preached on the holy process. This process where God not only humbles us, but, but transforms us and he reconciles us and he, he perfects us in the cross. And regardless of resume, regardless of what we've done in our past, we're not perfect. But we are made perfect through righteousness gifted us by the cross. And so I press forward, I try to, to be as Christ was. Today we're gonna be in Philippians chapter three, verse 17. So if you have your Bibles, notebooks, and pens, I encourage you, whip them out, take some notes. The title of my sermon today is called A Holy Example. A Holy Example. Philippians chapter three, verse 17. I'll be reading from the NIV. It says this. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But see, our citizenship is in heaven. And so we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for just 
allowing me on the stage and just to deliver your word. And Lord, I just pray that, that you speak through me and that, that your words penetrate those who need it. Regardless of whether they're watching online or in person, Father, Lord, I pray that your word can penetrate and pierce their hearts, that they might feel convicted, that they might get right with you today. And Lord, I pray that everybody here today, that they might learn something. They might learn something that might bring them closer to you. Lord, I thank you for everything that you do. It's in your son's name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. So you guys know I'm a youth pastor, right? And so during youth, we play a lot of games, like a lot of them. And so I'm not going to try to be somebody I'm not. I'm going to continue playing games today because I like them. So I'm going to need everybody to stand up real quick. Stand up. Stand up. Yep. We're going to play one of the oldest childish childhood games that I personally know. It's called Simon Says. And we're going to play this, and we're going to see who wins. This is just real quick. Entertain me. Ready? Simon Says Jump. Simon says, clap your hands. Simon says, find somebody you don't know and give them a high five. Yeah, greet your neighbors. Greet them. Yep. 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 I'll wait. Simon says, say good morning. Simon says, say hi to Pastor Mike if he's watching. Uh, now sit down. I got one person. Two people, three people. Nice. All right, Simon says sit down. <laughs> I play that game for, for several different reasons, but one of them, I, as I was thinking about this game, I, I thought something. Who is Simon? Uh, I don't know who Simon is, and upon a lot of research, uh, I still don't know who Simon is. So my guess is it's Simon Peter, the disciple which would make sense. I don't know, but that's my guess. But today we're not talking about Simon Peter. We're really talking about the Apostle Paul and his letter that he writes. Now, it's interesting because as I was reading this, I'm really thinking about this game. Because Paul, what he's doing is he's playing like the ultimate game of Simon Says. He's sitting there telling everybody, hey, do as I do. Simon Says jump. Actually, Peter says jump. So you jump. Peter says, imitate Christ. So imitate Christ. He's sitting there and saying, hey, reflect who I am. Why? Because I reflect Christ. And so he's playing this massive game of Simon Says. You don't believe me? Let's read. Verse 17, it says this. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Paul is not saying, man, I am the et all, like the be all. I'm not, I'm not the only person you must follow. It's not this egotistical thing. He's not saying, man, I am the only one who knows about Christ, so only follow me. He's sitting there and saying, hey, do yourself a favor. Follow mature believers. Follow people who can influence you to do as Christ would do. He's sitting there very, very, join us as a model. It's not about Paul, it's about the bride of Christ. It's about the church. It's about the pastors. It's about the people who can pour into you. I would even argue this. In 1 Corinthians, he even says this, to imitate me as I imitate Christ. It's not about me, it's not about the pastors who get up on stage. It's not about the leaders that you have. It's about the fact that they follow Christ. And so Paul is really saying, man, join me. Join me. Follow me. Why? Because I'm humble. I'm humbly, radically dependent on Christ. I follow Christ in all of my days, regardless of the situation. Follow me as I follow Christ. To give you some context, remember, he's in jail. He's about to be persecuted, murdered, killed for his belief. He's willing to put everything on the line for Christ. And he's saying this because 
guess what? It's not the persecution that's my goal. It's Christ honoring and loving and, 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 and worshiping God. And so follow me as I continue to worship God. Why? Because honestly, we need people and leaders to practice what they preach. That's why. I'm not going to say I know a lot about leadership, but I will say this. If somebody comes up to me and tells me to do something that they're not willing to do, I'm not following them. I, re I refuse to follow them. And what's interesting about leadership is any book that you ever read about leadership, you'll learn this. Leadership is just influence. That's all it is. How you influence people. And so Paul is very clearly saying, hey, allow your influence to come from a place of godliness. Because here's the truth. Every single person, regardless of whether you're business leaders, regardless of whether you're pastors, we are influenced by either God or the world. And so very upfront, he's saying, man, choose a godly individual. Choose a godly influence. Choose to be on the right side of things. And then he continues. He continues by saying, oh, I'm sorry, my first point. My first point is this. We need to be a holy example that depends on Christ and his bride. As leaders, as influencers, as people who go out and influence anybody, whether it be our children, whether it be our family, whether it be our friends, Paul is very clear and upfront about this, that we are to imitate him. We are to depend on Christ. We are to depend on his bride. We are to depend on each other. We are to sit there and look at a holy example rather than a worldly example. And so we follow that, that, that holy example. He says this after this. He says, man, for as I have often told you before, and I'll tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. You have to understand something. As leaders, as individuals, as Christ followers, as believers, we're supposed to, like, feel, right? We're supposed to, if we're imitating Christ, Christ is what? Christ is loving, correct? He's empathetic. He died for the world, right? Not one individual. And so, really, my point number two is, is this. A holy example they mourn the O's who are enemies. As I was reading this, really, what struck me as odd was Paul's in prison. He's been persecuted. There have been stones thrown at him. People have gone after him, all for what he believes. Modern day, we would be like, oh, that's so much injustice. But not once in any of his letters have I ever read that he cried over his circumstances. Not once have I ever read, I might be wrong, but, but I have never seen it, where he's saying, oh, woe is me. Oh my gosh, I'm in prison. Oh, my finances aren't in order. Oh my gosh, people hate me. Oh, the world is out to get me. No, rather, what he does is he's solid in his faith. He seeks only to glorify God. And what strikes me as odd is, is in this verse, he sits there and says, man, I say this with tears. I am mourning. I am crying. There are people out there that don't know God or let alone they know him and they're still enemies of God. They despise what he, what he loves. They, they, they hate the cross. Now, these aren't enemies of a literal symbol of the cross. There aren't people out there like, like he's not really talking to the people who, who like are burning crosses in, in a wild little forest. No. 
He's talking about those who can't even grasp the cross. He's talking to those who sit there and say, man, like, yeah, I have, I have Jesus. But then every single action afterwards is all worldly. That'll come on a Sunday, sit down and be like, yep, this is where it's at, and then leave and act completely different. They can't practice what they preach. But it'll sit down on a Sunday and be like, man, uh, my life, my family, we're perfect. I don't curse. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do any of these things. And the minute they get in the car, that's a wild car ride. Things are flying in the air. People are cursing. I can't believe you. Oh, now my lunch plans are ruined. He's talking to those. He's talking about the people who who can't grasp the concept of Jesus dying for us. Who can't grasp the concept that that just because he dies for us doesn't mean we can live the way we want to live. You don't believe me? Let's look. It says this, their destiny in verse 19. Their destiny is destruction. And their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. He's not talking about fat people. It's, it has nothing to do with their stomachs. He's talking about the enemies of biblical truth. He's talking about the enemies who, who don't want to follow the cross, who, who refuse to pick up their cross daily. He's talking about those who really don't understand what it means to deny themselves. He's talking about those who, who really, they seek their own ways. It's really clear the destruction is what? Their damnation. They don't even know where they're headed. They can't even comprehend it. Their belly is in reference to wanting them please, their bodies, their minds, their souls. It's all about myself. It has nothing to do with anybody else. They live for themselves alone. And their glory is their shame. They do things that really should bring them shame, but instead they, they're talking proudful about it. They're boasting about it. Yeah, man, I went to that rager last week. I got totally, totally wasted. Sitting there taking pride in things that that God is sitting, bro, like, what are you doing? You're sitting there saying you know Christ, but then you're acting completely opposite of Christ. Christ didn't think about himself when he was on that cross. Christ didn't think about himself while he's being whipped and beaten. Christ didn't think about himself. And yet we we sit here and like, yeah, we're Christian. We're Christ followers. Then we go out and we complain because our steak is medium and it should be medium rare. Ugh, I can only have the best. We sit there and refuse, refuse to do anything less than the best. We'll spend money, wild money, on cars and clothes. We'll pass by a neighbor who who has nothing. We'll look at a video about Africa and be like, man, that sucks for them. And we live in our own selves, in our own little bubble, not thinking or caring about anybody else. And then we act as if we're the ones being persecuted. We still, by the way, live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, despite the gas prices. People are still flocking to our borders constantly as refugees. Man, I need a place better than where I came. And yet we leave these these churches and these buildings only thinking of ourselves. Only thinking of our bellies. Only thinking about our mortgages. Only thinking about our car loan. 
only think about what, what we can get, our comforts. And there are people literally out there hurting that don't even know God. And yet we refuse to even speak to them about God. We can't mourn them. Why would we? We're too self-indulgent. Our own stomachs are so big, whether it be spiritually or physically, and we look at other people who are in need and we're like, man, oh, they need Jesus. I'll pray for them. Never. I'll sit there and be like, yeah, you know, man, yeah, you really should go to the therapist. No, you need Jesus. And you need to hear it from the person that's talking to you, the one who claims to be a Christian. We should mourn those who don't know God. When we look at ourselves, we should mourn our own actions. The moment we sit there and get so comfortable, oh, man, I got this, or I'm staying at a five-star hotel, that's great for you. But what about the homeless man that's sitting out there asking for a dollar? That not only needs a dollar, but also needs the word of God. I don't have the photo, but I will say this. Pastor Mike and I, we went to New Orleans recently to vote for the SBC. And uh, we went down this strip um, Bourbon Street, Bourbon Road. And it's like the, the, one of the biggest party strips in New Orleans. And we just walk through it and we're like, oh, let, like, let's see what this is about. And as Pastor Mike and I were walking, man, one of the things that were like, was, it was kind of heavy on our hearts. We started walking and, and I'm a photographer for those who don't know. Bless you. And so I'm walking, and I'm taking pictures of people, and, and I see this homeless man laid out bad, definitely on drugs. And Mike stops, and he's like, hey, you see that? And I look, and I was like, oh, man. And he looks at me, he's like, is he alive? I was like, bro, I don't know, let's check. And I remember just walking up to him, and and Honestly, and I'm a little ashamed about this, but I took a picture. And I took a picture because I was like, man, that, that's, that's horrible. It's so sad. And it brought me so much emotion. And for me as a photographer, I take pictures, and that's how I show emotion. But I walked up to him, and, and he's like, he's out. Like, he's, he is, he's definitely high. And so Mike and I, we walk away. And we, we pray. We don't do anything. So we went up to the hotel room, and that ate me alive the whole day. And I sat there thinking about it. I was like, man, like, was that a Samaritan, and I, did I just pass them by? Like, Lord, like, like, did I just ignore somebody that's truly in need? And so later that night, at like 12 at night, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go downstairs, I'm going to take my camera, I'm going to continue taking pictures. Why not? And so I'm going downstairs, but in the back of my head and in my heart, I'm like, man, I really hope I find that guy. I want to talk to him. And as I'm walking up and down the strip, which is super sketchy, very, very, probably should not do it that late at night, Mike stayed up in his hotel room, and, and as the hours began to pass, he starts texting me and calling me, and, and, and I don't answer. So he starts freaking out, thinking I got jumped or something. But see, what happened was this. I was walking down looking for that homeless man to talk to him about Jesus, to let him know that I, he wasn't just a picture or a story that I took. But along came this man who, who's trying to sell me some beads, and I was like, nah, man, I don't want beads, but, and I don't really have money. You, get, you take cash app? No, I'm homeless. <laughs> but I sit there and I'm like, you know what? This is a perfect time. Hey, man, let me hear your story. Let me know what's going on with you. 
And he starts telling me his story, and, and quite literally, my heart is breaking for this man. And then he turns to me, and he's like, so what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm a pastor. He's like, oh. Like, what happens normally when you say that? I'm like, nah, but, but Jesus loves you, and he cares for you. And believe it or not, Jesus is crying to know you. He desires to know you. He's mourning for you. And this guy, he kind of looks at me. He's like, yeah, you're, I'm the crazy one. <laughs> like, all right. He walks away. But then this, this other guy comes up. He hears what I'm saying. Also homeless. Before I can do anything, he starts cleaning the very shoes I have on now. And I'm like, no, man, I don't have money. I'm so sorry. He's like, no, no. It's not about the money. I heard, I heard what you were saying. And he looks at me and he was like, when I was a kid, they told me this story about how Jesus washed feet. And so all I'm trying to do is shine your boots. And I was like, oh, man. And I'm like, that's crazy. And so we start talking. And he was like, no. He's like, when I was younger, I really wanted to be a pastor. He's like, but here's the truth. I grew up in New Orleans, drinks everywhere, drugs everywhere, and it got hold of me. And it took me away. And I just don't know how to find my way back. And so I spent the next two hours talking to this man, praying over this man, sobbing. He was crying. I was like, oh, man, that's crazy. All while Pastor Mike was blowing up my phone like, did you get stabbed? <laughs> no, nah, man, I'm good. See, the truth is when we start really living examples of Christ, our hearts mourn for those who are lost. There's a desire to get closer with them, to be in their presence, to tell them that they are loved and they are cared for, to show them biblical truths, to give it to them, not to live as enemies of the cross, but to show them that they can be in the graces of God. Because God, he didn't die just for me, just for a pastor, he died for everyone. And so we mourn those who, who don't understand this, who can't grasp it. We mourn our brothers and sisters when they start to forget this. We mourn our brothers and sisters when they act like enemies of the cross, when they really should be the, the friends of the cross, advocating for God, pushing the gospel, pursuing that goal. And so we mourn those things. We mourn them because we want them to get closer with Christ. And what's interesting is that Paul doesn't tell us that there are multiple subgroups of people. He really just gives us two examples. You are either an enemy of the cross or you are a follower of the cross. You either proclaim his glory purely with good intentions or you're just calling yourself a Christian for the sake of getting into heaven. And he only gives us two groups. That's it. And my third and final point, holy examples remember the end game. They remember the end game. They remember what it's all for. They understand that we're constantly trying to reach this, this, this area of heaven. Where we're trying constantly to be more and more and more Christ-like. And it's for a reason. Verse 20, it says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. For a second, you guys got to remember this. Paul's... Paul's playing to the word citizenship. To be a Roman citizen meant everything. To be a non-citizen, you couldn't even marry legally. You can't own land. Your children can't own land. You can't fight in the armies. You were a second or third class. And so he sits there and he says, man, this is not about the world you live in today. 
Every day you wake up and you pursue to be more and more like Christ, not because of today, but because of what will end up happening in the end. You do this out of your love for Christ. You do this out of your love and your passion to be connected with him. You are not a citizen of this world. The United States doesn't hold anything to me when I die. It can't give me anything the moment I'm dead. But rather you are citizens of heaven. And by who we, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. It's about the end. We do things for the end, not for today, not for my mortgage, not for my car note, not for the vacation I'm going to have, not for any of those things. We persevere and we push at the end because here's the truth. Two things you can't do in heaven. You can't sin and you can't bring others to know Christ. Man, I, I, I think about a lot of the people I know who, who like, I'm like, man, will I see them in heaven? Do I even mourn for them? Do my actions even display that I care for them? We're to, to act as if today was our final day. It's about the end, the finish line. It's about what happens towards that. It has nothing to do about today. And so as we live as holy examples, we're really doing our best to not only mimic that of Christ, to not only mourn those who don't know him, but to also remember why we're doing it, what we're doing it for. You're not saving or you're not, you're not telling somebody about Christ for your own edification. You're remembering at the end of all days, God is going to make us righteous again. He's going to bring us into the fold. Like, like, take a moment to think about that. To be in the presence of of God, the creator of everything, who loved you more than everything, who died on the cross for you, who was whipped and beaten and persecuted and mocked and made fun of, who, who decided to, to let go of his own godliness and, and humble himself for us. And we get to be in his presence for eternity. Not a year, not a couple months, for all of time. Where we get to, to, to praise him and honor him and love him. And it doesn't go one way. He loves us too. He honors us too. He makes us right. The United States has nothing over the citizenship of heaven. And here's the truth. If, if I truly love God, if I truly love who Jesus is, then I will love his people too, just as he loved them. And so I will mourn for those enemies. I will seek them out. I will preach to them. I will proclaim the good news to them. It does not matter what happens. It does not matter how they persecute me. It's not how they make fun of me. It's not how they make me feel. None of that matters. What matters is that, guess what? They might too experience that beautiful moment in heaven where they can sit before their Lord and their Lord can sit there and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. See, most of us, we sit here day in and day out, and, and, and we don't even understand the rules of the game. 
But Paul is sitting here very clearly and saying, man, you need to imitate God. It is the most, it is the world's biggest spiritual game of Simon Says. Because here's the thing, God says, go out and evangelize. Go out and make my gospel known to those who are enemies of the cross, to those who indulge in their own selfishness, to those who, who would rather follow worldly views than godly views. And we'll sit there and be like, oh, that, that's not me, that's, that's, that's Pastor Nick or Pastor Mike. No, it's you. Be holy examples in every season. Look at what God has done for you and wish that upon somebody else who has no hope, no joy, no love. You look at the world and it's so divided between politics and injustices between World War III. We have so many different things that are so chaotic to the world. And so you have here Paul sitting and being like, man, I have the answer. It's Christ and him to be known. And so no matter what, no matter what happens to me, who cares about me? God is going to give me a new body anyways. Who cares that I get beaten? God's going to give me a new body anyways. Who cares if people make fun of me? In heaven, that doesn't exist. Who cares if people think lowly of me? God thinks highly of me. So highly, he died on the cross for me. And Paul is like, man, you have, I'm instructing you to be the light in this world. Not just pretenders, doers. Not people who just walk and sit down and oh, I did my church service. But go out and bless the world. Go on and make a difference. Because the moment we stop doing that, guess what? We become enemies of the cross. Focused on our own bellies. Focused on our own delights. There is a beautiful balance between faith and works. And when we have faith in him, we are given eternal life. You're not called just to sit there and say, Lord, I believe in you, and that's it. It's not a free ticket. You're called to go and be doers of the word, be holy examples of the word, to depend on Christ, to depend on the church, to mourn those who look as, they're, as if they're enemies, to remember at the end of the day why you're doing it, even in persecution, man, I know at the end of all days, I will be made whole again. Paul loved God, and he was unashamed about it. He was unashamed about teaching it, unashamed about sharing it, unashamed about maturing in his walk with Christ, unashamed about continuing this, this holy process that Mike talked about last week. And he was not going to sit idly by and watch. If you're really to imitate Christ, if you're really to imitate Paul and the disciples, where is your church plant? Where are your disciples? Where are those you pour into? Where are those you edify? Where are those that you look back in Scripture and saying, look, this, this is what we must do? Where are they? Because the truth is, most of us, we sit there acting as if we're friends of the cross, but truthfully, we're enemies of it. 
only thinking of ourselves, ashamed of sharing the gospel, scared of sharing the gospel, scared of going out and being mocked for God who was first mocked. Man, my hope today is that you go out and you're not just just pretenders of the word, but you were doers of the word. You set that example to everybody. You start influencing people for Christ, not for the world. You start leading by example. You start preaching what you say, what you practicing what you preach. And in those times where it's hard, when you're struggling, then you remember what, what Paul said. Surround yourself with people who are mature Christians. Do as I do. Surround yourself with bodies of believers so they too can hold you accountable. Man, today I pray that as you leave this building, that you feel rocked, that God convicts you that you become doers of the word, that a light, a fire is lit inside of your soul. The next time you pass by a homeless man, you're not sitting there like, all right. But you start preaching the word of God to them. And you start loving them the way Jesus loved you first. Regardless of whether it impacts your work, your schooling, your family, your friends, I would sacrifice all of that just so I could get what Christ has. Let's pray. Father, I just pray now more than anything. Lord, that you convict our hearts to do more, not for the sake of doing more, but for the sake of growing in you, Father. Father. And Lord, when, when we start living our life through our stomachs, through our bellies, through our indulgences, that you rebuke us, that you correct us, that you humble us, that you remind us what the end game is. Lord, that you allow people here today to start living that holy example by depending on you, Father. By looking at you and saying, Lord, like this is the way I must be. It's not a suggestion, it's a commandment. To love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as our neighbors, Father. So, Lord, bring them closer to you. And, Lord, when we see enemies of the cross, Lord, that our hearts break and they mourn and we cry. And, Lord, our mission is to get them saved, Father to bring your news to them and their door, Father. Lord, I pray for a holy conviction over this church and its leaders. Lord, allow us to be that holy example. Allow us to leave here wanting to be closer with you. So much so that we reflect everything that you've done. Lord, I thank you so much for all that you do. And it's your son's name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand in worship. What an amazing message. And thank you again for joining us here at Lifted Church on our YouTube experience. If you made any decision, whether it was giving your life to Christ, getting baptized, or even joining teams, we want to make sure they get connected with you today. So fill out that QR code at the bottom of your screen, and one of our pastors or leaders will reach out to you. As always, it was blessed to have you join us and we will see you next week.